Welcome to Wager Talk Friday's version of the Sweet 16. We're going to talk about all four games, maybe some prop thoughts, also best bets from Friday's card. Let's get right to it. I'm Scott with Marco and Dave. First game on the board is West Virginia taking on Villanova, where the Wildcats are laying five and a half. The total, Dave, has dropped a couple of points. It was 154 and a half going into Wednesday morning. It's down a bucket, a full bucket, down to 152 and a half. Bottom line is, I think we're going to find out early if Huggy Bear is going to have to change his defensive style. I really believe if they're down 11 to 4, 11 to 3, 10 to 2 at the start of this game, he's going to have to make a real quick move out of that full press type defense because Villanova's got the guys who know how to handle it. Uh, we got, uh, it does appear as though there's been some a little sharp play on the West Virginia side so far. I'm talking to Jason Simmel from CG Technology. Uh, I will mention that I have this as my 5% play. It's been up all week long. The wager talk is the first. I, I made this play immediately. It was put up on Monday uh, because I do believe in trying to get ahead of the curve, sure. so to speak, as far as the number is concerned. So if you want to get that game, check it out at wagertalk.com. That's all I'm going to say about it. Well, there you go. Uh, Marco, when I looked at this game, I kind of agreed that the total might come down on it. I didn't bet it myself. I'm kind of like David that I'm not a guy who plays a lot of totals. I got a couple of guys who we exchange plays and all that kind of stuff. If they're on a total, I'll generally look generally look to play that total. But other than that, I like him in the NBA. I'm not crazy about college basketball totals. Uh, but from what we've seen out of Villanova, not only do you have six players and double figures per night scoring-wise, which is yeah. crazy, but you got two outstanding dishers and ball handlers for this team. They don't turn the ball over a whole lot. We might even see Bob Huggins have his team come out and not play in that crazy pace on the defensive end. To try well, to they, throw a little wrench into the system. They went 1-3-1 in they the last to. game. Well, they didn't have to. I shouldn't say that. But, that but they did good, change things up, and it was a good move. It was a very that good was adjustment. a perfect component for them, though. Yeah. You know, it's like funny because we were mentioning, uh, Dave, you brought it up during the course of the season, Wichita State being slow afoot. That was like the perfect matchup for Marshall, and then Marshall yeah. was the perfect matchup for West Virginia. They really were. And that was, by the way, I had West Virginia as a 5% play last weekend against Marshall. I thought it was absolutely the perfect matchup for them. Uh and it was, it was, it was a pretty easy so. game. Yeah. <laughs> so, I wish they were all like that. I, that was a free play for me at Wager Talk was West Virginia, and uh, it was nice to have them come through because that was right after the Cincinnati game lost. Oh. So at least we finished up with on a winning note. Yeah. West Virginia's had an easy road to here. I mean, they had Murray State in the first game, which tried, you know, play a little bit faster pace with them, and they just didn't have the athletes to do it with West Virginia. And West Virginia was able to get out to that big lead and maintain it. We've seen too many times this year, though, with this West Virginia team, that they do get out to that early lead because teams take a little bit of time to figure out that press. Remember, Dave, we did the radio show the Friday before they played Kentucky, and Kentucky, the Kentucky yeah, game. Yeah. And we talked about, you know, well, I'm going to take West Virginia for the first half and because I think the freshmen and stuff of Kentucky will have trouble, but I don't want any part of West Virginia for the full game. Well, did we ever think that they would have as bad of a second half as they did against Kentucky? They rolled in the first half, and then Kentucky, with their talent, once they figured things out, just slaughtered them. Well, that's what I think is going to happen here with this Villanova team. You talk about how balanced they are on scoring, and you look at them, the ball handlers. You got Brunson and Bridges. These two guys, nineteen and eighteen points. They're going to be if they do go with the press. Mm-hmm. They're going to be cracking this press and getting some easy looks. And I think that if Villanova gets out to a lead. West Virginia is going to be in trouble when they got to press the issue offensively because we've seen too often this year with West Virginia that whenever they do fall behind after surrendering or a lead, it they go all the way. They, they they just fold to ten almost. We saw it in all three Kansas games where they should have won at least two of those three games, and they ended up losing all of them. And they ended up not even covering the spreads when they were plus points. So I like Villanova here. This is a complete team. They're number five in the country uh, offensively, hitting fifty point three percent of their shots. And when they shoot the three, you know they're twelfth in the country, hitting forty percent of their threes. You crack that zone and you're getting easy buckets, transition buckets, and then when you are in a straight up, you know, offense and you're working the ball around mm-hmm. and you're getting open threes, I just think they got too much for it. Yeah, I don't care West if they it, this is a game where if they go to the one thirty one, sorry, ain't gonna work against Nova. I, I you know, yeah, like it did bring against in Marshall. Dante's Inferno off the off the bench and that kid shoot Jesus. away. Boy, Brunson and DiVincenzo for uh for Villanova, those two players have combined for three hundred assists on the mm-hmm. season. 
between the two of them, and they've got better than a two to one ratio, uh, assist to turnover ratio between the two of them. You have one great matchup in this game, Brunson Carter. Oh yeah, I mean Carter. I really like Carter. Yeah. I, he's just a, he's an outstanding player. Uh, I think he's actually underrated because sure. he, he Huggins gets more attention than any of his players. Yeah, and Carter's just been absolute glue on that team. I mean, he just keeps them together. Great flow leader. I think he's going to be able to play at the next level, even though he's not the most – he's not as raw talent as some guys, but he's just got a motor that's it just never stops. Texas Tech taking on Purdue. Saw mm. that the money's split in this particular game for the most part, according to Jason Symbol from CGT. Uh, Purdue about a one-and-a-half point favorite, total right around 137-and-a-half. And somebody on the set yesterday when we were cutting videos had mentioned about that brace that they were trying to come up with for Isaac Haas. But they said it hadn't been okayed yet by the NC two A. By all indications and by where the line is, it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. Like well, he's no, going to he, be able to play. I, I I did get some good information on this. Uh, ha, now the player will not benefit, of course, Haas. But the NCAA has determined that if this is a brace that they can then market as a <laughs> revenue producer, then then they'll clear it. You know, you had me. You you reeled me right in. I, I was all there. I was completely you think, there. But you think it, I'm making that up? Well, it's you're not. Pro- that's the no, problem. No, in the NCAA, right. it's probably it's somebody. Probably, think, yes. if, they, if they hadn't been thinking about they it, will now. And they heard this. <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. We can make more money. Hire the guy under the hat. And not, get, not, get, <laughs> and not give any of it to the player. I'll tell you one thing, though. If he does play with that, I don't know if it's better to have him play with that brace. What can he do on offense? things up on the offensive end or just sitting his butt down and letting you know the Edwards gang get out there for Purdue and, and make some noise in this particular game. So, and, and by the way, Vince Edwards, that Edwards, is a heck of of a rebounder. And so it's, you know, you're talking about a guy, he's not their best rebounder, Haas, but yeah, you'd like him in there and be healthy. But I don't want him in there if he's going 50, 60, 70%. The kid with the hair, he can play a little bit. A little bit, yeah. I mean, his, he's going to end up in Young time guy. being a better player than Haas. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, yeah. You know, he's he's because he's growing into his body, so he's sure. he put on like 25 pounds this year. Uh, he was really thin at the beginning of the season. This kid, he's just a kid. I mean, by the end of next year, I will bet he's 35, 40 pounds heavier than he is now, and this guy's going to play at the next level. I don't think Haas is, uh, not not as a regular. Let's put it no, that way. He's like a five and three guy. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I don't mean to. That's not that bad. No, coming I mean, up, he's, you know, but he he's tries hard. He's six just points and three or four rebounds a he night. Just he has certain limitations. Sure. I think the Harms kid has got a chance to be a real star. Yep. For me, Scott, in this one, generally whenever you get that injury you know, to a key player, I like to take that team in the first game, which that first game would have been the last game. They got the win without them. Now this would be the second game I would look to go against them. The one thing I'm going to point out about Haas, and we talked about this on the video, even though he's their second leading scorer of the starters, he plays the fewest minutes of right. the starters. He only averages 23 minutes a game. So... Yes, they're going to miss him, but are they going to miss him as much as they would somebody that's out that's normally out on the floor? And, and Marco, for 30- that's a good point, and that's why I was saying I would rather him sit out than to come in and play seventy percent of what he normally can. Yeah, I, I, I mean, would rather him know, sit out. The downside is you got to. I mean, the t- Taylor's he's not good. Sure, and the three or four minutes in each half that he might have to play. Uh, that, that's that's a bit of a, 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 a they'll go right at him. They have to stay out of foul trouble. Very important for Purdue to stay out of foul trouble. And that's the one worry I've got about Vince Edwards is he can get a little overly aggressive yeah. going for rebounds. And, you know, he picked up three in the first half the other night. He can't do that here. Sure. With that said, I think you're going to see a slower tempo in this game. I don't think Purdue wants to go up and down the floor. I, want, I think they want to shorten the game a little bit, not get themselves into that foul trouble. So I'm looking to the under in this one for the play. Just talk about these two teams, though, as far as against the spread. Now, we're, lo- we're looking at a game where the spread's not going to be a factor. We're, we're looking at a number of one and a half. So, basically, you know, just pick the winner. But these two teams have been absolute money burners mm. down the stretch. Purdue, their last 15 games, 3-12 and 12 against the spread. And then you flip it over to Texas Tech, and they are down the stretch. Last nine games, one seven and one against the spread. Neither one, you know, bodes confidence here for putting money on them. But I think because of the situation and because of the tighter pl- player rotation that Purdue's going to have to go with, I do like the under in this game. Also, real quick note on that: if Haas doesn't play in this game, which he's probably not going to, the line would be three if he does, if he was healthy. Right. But Texas Tech's not a very good. They're not a great rebounding team. 
Another caveat with playing Texas Tech and what if the lines makers are, you know, if the line is where the if the game ends up being kind of where the lines makers, you know, have lined it one and a half or two, and it is a close game, you've got a Texas Tech team that isn't too hot from the free throw line. And no, I hate not. that when I'm talking about Which a game that can be close to it. weird because they've got so many good guys exactly. in ISO, yep. the ISO offense that they run. You'd think that that type would be able to knock down free throws, but they're not sure. that good. No. Syracuse and Duke, guys. Duke laying 11.5, total 133. And we heard an interesting comment from Jason Symbol on Wednesday afternoon on the Las Vegas Sports Line when he said, out of all the teams we need, we need Duke. How about if Duke that? wins the national yeah. title, we're doing pretty good because of all the, the, the people that have bet longer shot teams. Duke right now, 3-1 uh, to one at CGT as we speak. And this particular game, again, about an 11.5 point uh, favorite over the Cuse. They just played each other a few weeks ago, late February. And, boy, I've always said this. You throw a press at a press at a team that presses, mm. they tend to struggle. You throw a zone at a team that likes to zone, they sometimes struggle. Well, Duke's been playing a whole lot of zone. They played it against Syracuse when they met a couple of weeks ago, and they beat Syracuse 60-44. to 44. They know a thing or two, about a thing or two, about the Syracuse Orange. For me, it's either Duke or nothing in this one, guys. Uh, uh, are you worried at all? I know it seems outlandish to suggest this in a Sweet 16 game. But are you worried at all that Duke takes this one for granted? I mean, they're big favorites. They handled this team with no problem. Syracuse is... (laughs) They're the last team last in. Team in yeah. the la- I mean, Duke could be looking at this going, geez, this is fantastic. And Syracuse is playing with nothing to lose. They're playing great defense. I think there's more of a chance of that happening with this kind of a Duke team than 10 yeah, years ago that, because they're younger guys. They're now, younger guys. guys. That, that, uh, that's the first thing that struck me is, boy, I know Duke ought to handle this team. Sure. But this game could be tougher than... Than they want it to be, and you know, Syria. I mean, Bayheim's pretty good at this well, stuff. Well, they're, they're so darn confident at playing his defense. Yep. You know, every time, every version for Syracuse next year, the year after, they're always as long as Bayheim's there, they're so ultra confident that it's going to work if they play their matchup and zone. It's, and it's gravy train time for them. I mean, you know, let's face it, they they got a chip on their shoulder because they were, oh, Syracuse shouldn't even be in. They're only in because you know they're Syracuse and Bayheim, blah 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 sure. blah. Now they're three and zero in the tournament, and. uh and everything's going right for them. I mean, they sucked against Michigan State. Yeah, Michigan they State terrible. had so many open looks and missed. Well, and that's, and that's why I can't possibly play Syracuse. Right. Because they, they've had no business winning that game. But they did. And, you know, this team's just completely free and easy at this point. I don't think they're good enough to stay with Duke, but I, I'm not going to lay the points. I'm going to stay out of this game. What do you think about the line? It was 13 a couple of weeks ago at Duke. It's 11 and a half with the game being played in Omaha. Only only a point and a half, two point adjustment from when it was at Cameron Indoor. Well, I I, I think that's because if the odds makers are looking at it and saying what a lot of the public's going to say is which, this is just this is a mismatch. Yeah, they got last team in. Like yeah. you just said. Yep, I'm staying. I, I'm staying. I'm listening. Yeah, it's Duke or nothing for me right now. It's I, nothing. <laughs> it, it's either that or the under. Sure, because there's not Syracuse can't play offense. Okay. So where are they going to get the points from? Yep. And that's the whole thing. If they do struggle to get points, which they're going to struggle to do it, this could get ugly. And we look at that last meeting where Duke won 60 to 44. Duke was only 2 of 18 from three-point range in that game and still won by 16. If they just make a couple more of those yeah. threes, you're talking about, you know, a 20, 25-point blowout sure. in – we we talk about Duke. Their defense is better now than it was. You know, once they went to the zone, it totally changed the look of this Duke team. Mm-hmm. They're holding everybody down, and you're talking about one of the worst offensive teams in the country now going against a red hot defense. I did. I don't know where Syracuse gets the points. Yeah. They struggled to get, you know, into the 50s. So like 310th shooting, field goal percentage accuracy, you know, crazy. You know, they scored 60 points against Arizona State. Arizona State was horrible down the stretch. Another team that didn't even belong yeah. right. to be in the play, play-in play game. And they still only got 60 points They there. were down seven late in that game. They scored all the points yeah. in the, at the end of the game to, to survive. Yeah, I it's, I have no problem laying the points with with Duke, and I don't think, you know, Krzyzewski calls the dogs off, uh, you know, on this one, you know, too. And the thing is, if he does call the dogs off, 
Syracuse doesn't they're not, have. They're the, not calling the dogs off. Yeah, yeah but they don't have the te- they don't have the yep. team to fire Catch up, up threes to come to come back back door in it. You know, it's funny. Out of all the years that these two, I mean, gosh, Coach K's been around forever. Bayheim's been around forever. Two storied and great programs who have seen plenty of deep runs in the tournament. And yet these two coaches have only faced each other one time. How about that, huh? In their histories in the well, big you dance. You said that in videos. 20 I was years like, ago. you got to be kidding And me. it was like 1998. It was 20 yeah. years ago. Duke won the game. I, it, I When I saw that stat, again, like I just said, I know it's useless trivia, but it's kind of interesting. It just blew me away a little bit. Clemson and Kansas, final game. We're going to talk about the Jayhawkers laying four and a half total, 143. And, uh, boy, Kansas has been as impressive as anybody over the last five games uh, they've been on fire. They made more than half their shots in those five outings. They even averaged 10 of 22 from the three-point line in those games. But they are upside down on the glass and will now face a Clemson team that has held their last five opponents to 36% shooting. If you're going to beat Kansas, and I'll explain why in a little bit, you got to turn the ball, you got to get them to turn the ball over. You don't beat them when they're turning the ball over nine or ten times a game. And hit them with a the zone. Hit them with a the zone, yeah. Because Kansas is not that good against the zone. Uh, the big kid for Kansas is getting healthier. That's going to be, you know, he's 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 a force. Uh, he's sketchy offensively, but but he's just a defensive dominator. And so Clemson's going to have to knock down some shots from outside here. Uh, but they're on a roll. And Auburn just was just completely overwhelmed by them last week. Uh, this is going to be, a, I think this will be an overwhelming public play on Kansas. So if you're into that stuff, and again, that's not how I base my plays, but if you are into that stuff, then you, I guess, can look at the Clemson side because they're going to get, what, 25% of the tickets on this game? I think Probably. this I, – I don't, I don't have the ticket counts to this point. They don't matter at this point. But by game day, Kansas is going to be getting all the tickets. Now, the money might be a different story. And again, I, I don't put a great deal of stress into that myself. I handicap the games on – the way I match up the teams, and I've made my decision in this game. It's also a play that's going to be up at Wager Talk, so we'll, we'll, we'll okay. leave it at that. But for those who do value uh, sharp square splits, I can't say the sharps are going to be on Clemson, but the squares will be all over Kansas in this game. And I, I'm like you. I, people love to hear that around the country when I do national shows. They always want to talk about where's the Joes, where's the pros. Mm-hmm. I get that. That's fun stuff. Yeah. But it matters nothing to what I'm betting. No, hell, I'll play. I don't I'll, care if it's 80-20. I, I don't care. I, and, I didn't have a problem playing against the Cleveland Browns and in the, the NFL season, every week for two years. which meant I was opposite, <laughs> I was opposite the Sharps on a weekly basis, yeah. and it worked out pretty and well. And also, you know, during the regular season, 70% of the money on a college basketball game or college basketball card is generally sharper money, 30% of the money they get. It's more 50-50 when it gets to the big dance, so yeah. the numbers are skewed yeah. a little bit, Marco. Yeah, you look at Kansas, and I'll be surprised if it's that overwhelming – Name-wise, I agree with you guys. Kansas is the name. They're hot at the right time. And really, looking at Kansas and looking at Kentucky, they're mirror images of of each other right now. They got hot at the the end of the season. They both rolled off winning streaks, losing just one game during that stretch. And both of them, ironically, were road games, the final game of the regular season that didn't mean anything once the conference's titles were already decided. So this is a team that's on a roll. But... Clemson looked so good against Auburn, and everybody got to see that game and see how good Clemson looked. Granted, you know, maybe they hadn't seen Auburn that much this year, but, you know, Auburn did win the SEC title this year, and they just got embarrassed. I mean, they, that they, game they, was they, over six they, minutes into you know, the game. Auburn, I look, it, I, Pearl did a great job with that team this year, but when McLemore got hurt, that was it. That was the yep. end. And, and everybody knew it. Yeah. The place for Auburn. Yeah. I mean, you could see it. And you look at this Clemson team, and because they play in the ACC, you know, the ACC is overshadowed by the dominance that Virginia had this year. And then you had North Carolina Duke, the you know, the blue bloods of the, of the conference. You look at Clemson, they played good defense. This is a team mm-hmm. that over the last 12 games of the season, they held 10 of the 12 opponents to 42% or less, eight of those – 39% or less. So they can, you know, it's not Virginia numbers, but a good defense is going to keep you in the ball game. And Saturday, that game, Kansas, you know, where they ended up 
the three pointer at the buzzer, you know, got them beat on the spread, but they sure. won the game. Yes, Seton Hall. Yeah, I was I was at Caesar, I was at Caesars playing playing cards and watching the games, and I'll tell you what, that sports book erupted. I'll bet it well, did. There was a ton of Seton Hall money I'll, I'll on you, Saturday. I'll tell you what, I, you know, you were I, I was that was at the end. That was when we first started. I think that was right about the first time we got into the restaurant to start eating. Yeah. And I got a text from uh, Adam Joseph, AJ from uh, who who works with Opportunity Village. He's been on the show quite a bit. He's at the SLS, and there's a group of guys down there, and I didn't make it down there Saturday night, was out to eat. But he, he sends me the text, and he's like, yeah, we got him with Seton Hall, blah, 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 you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't text him back because at the at the time, I wanted to – that's when Gonzaga was actually starting to fall apart. Yeah. And I thought I, – I, I know it sounds funny with the jinxes and super – I'm like, oh. I cannot text him back and say, woohoo or winner, winner, chicken yeah, dinner, yeah, or yeah, anything yeah. until Gonzaga pulls this game out against Ohio State, and yeah. they did. It was a very good day. Yeah, so, you know, this one – I'm torn on this one. I want to see where the movement goes in this game, and if it floats up enough, maybe I get involved with Clemson. But I, this is the only one I'm really. You think on it's going to go up? I don't think it gets to five. I think it keeps keeps hanging around four and a half. I think I see. That's why I think if it gets to five, the sharps will jump in it just on numbers. The numbers guys will just say, "Well, no, that's too much. We're going to take the other side." You um, think it gets up? Goes up? If you if the public gets involved in once the the blue bar, blood they want sure. the, they want the Kansas team then they do and that's what the thing is you know you're going to get everybody you're going to get the weekend warriors come in again tomorrow absolutely you know and those are the guys Tonight. that are you know better and let's face it you know the sharps put their money in as soon as the numbers there they're looking for the recreational players. They're betting day by day because their bankrolls a lot of times don't. Yeah, Listen, that's why recreational players end up taking dogs on the money line, even though they get. Well, here you go, though. Here's here's the good thing. Well, not the good thing, but here's just something to point out. That's the first game on Friday. If that's the last game on Friday, I think that number goes up if the public yeah. getting beat up yeah. early. Yeah. So it is the early game on Friday, 4.05 Pacific time. So that might hold it back a little, a little bit, bit, but it's Pub- not the public, last game. The, the dog betters, we're talking recreational betters, they're going to they're gonna go money line on Clemson in this game. Uh that's what. So this this will be ideally what the books are going to want in this game is a Kansas win by less than the spread. Kansas win, Clemson cover. The books will clean up. This is what I was talking about when it came to turnovers and what Clemson needs to do. I just want to wrap it up with this: um, the last five games, Clemson has forced less than eight turnovers per game. Less than eight, not eighteen, but their opponents last five have averaged like seven point eight turnovers per game against Clemson. If you don't turn. Kansas over, you're not going to beat them. Yeah. Here's what's happened. The last, if you look at a few of their losses, Kansas, they had 17 turnovers in the last loss that they suffered against Oklahoma State, 16 against Arizona State, 15 in a loss to Texas Tech. If you can't turn this team over 14 to you know, at least 14 or 15 times, I don't think Clemson can beat them. And right now they're not getting after it. Of course, against Auburn, you didn't have to get after it. But still, that's a five-game stretch where they're not forcing turnovers. Any... um. Props that you're looking at, Marco, for Friday's game. There's one, and that goes to the Villanova game. I, I think Villanova runs ragged over West Virginia. I think they crack that press. And like you said, Huggy Bear might even just come out of that, you know, just come say we press. can't do it. We, you know, we can't do it against a team like this. But I think uh, Jalen Brunson, over 18 points. Again, they're going to have a lead. I think he's going to get a lot of – Cheap buckets when they break containment, mm-hmm. get the open looks. This team can hit the three, and then if he's at the foul line at the end of the game, you're getting a you know with the clock not moving, getting cheap points. I like him over 18. That's the only one that stuck out to me on Friday. Good stuff, guys. When we come back, we're going to give our best bets for Friday's game. Stick around. Every Tuesday, WagerTalk.com offers a best bet selection from its hottest handicapper. It's a great way to introduce yourself to wagertalk.com with a big best bet winner for just $2 on $2 Tuesday. Welcome back to Wager Talk Friday version of the Sweet 16, and it's a best bet time. We'll start with Dave Koken. And Dave, uh, four games to choose from. Where are we going, side or total in these games? Uh, I'll go a total on the Syracuse Duke game because I don't know where Syracuse's offense is going to come, especially against the zone. Uh, I, I know that they're obviously they're used to playing against the zone because they do it every day in practice, but I just don't know where their offense is going to come from. And I don't think Bayheim is certainly not going to want to get into a running shoot match with, with Duke because he'd have no chance in a game like that. So to me, you know, take, take as much of the shot clock as you can 
and try and stay within range, particularly in the first half, uh, I think that'll contribute to a lower scoring game. So Syracuse and Duke to stay under the total. Be sure to check out Dave on Twitter at Dave Koken and also uh, get his uh, check out the packages that he's going to have uh, Thursday night for Friday's games and throughout the day on Friday. And don't forget, he gets involved in Major League Baseball preseason and exhibition action and uh, turn out a profit so far. And those three well. percent plays are a perfect two and zero. Uh, send me those. <laughs> <laughs> I do send them to you. No, I'm kidding. Um, Marco at Marco you don't in play Vegas. Him, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what happens is I never mind. You can Marco, lead a Marco horse in to Vegas. Water. You can't you make know, him there you go. Yeah. I was going to say something smart, Alec, and I decided not to. And then that opens the door for Marco yeah. to rush right through. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Marco, but, but you lead Scott to a bottle of Jameson. He'll ah, tell you. Now we're talking, yes. <laughs> I've been a little bit more uh, Woodford Reserve than Jameson lately. Oh, you, know? okay. you got to switch it up from time to time. You can't always be Irish. Yeah. Well, um, those those five percent have been doing good. You're uh, up in it a little bit. Oh, I thought you about alcohol. It says a lot more than 5%. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marco, what do you got for us? Oh, I'm going to stay in that Syracuse-Duke game. And here's the thing. We talk about the Syracuse offense, how bad it is, and how much they've struggled. Now they're going to be facing the best defense that they faced during this three-game run, and they can't get out of the 50s. So what are they going to do against Duke? And the advantage that Duke has now in where Syracuse had advantage over a lot of these teams is teams haven't faced Bayheim's defense. Mm-hmm. So when you see that for the first time, then you throw it into you're playing in arenas that you don't, you know, you're not used and accustomed to. The sight lines are different. Teams have struggled. Well, Duke sees this. They prepare for it every year in the ACC. So they're not going to be as, you know, having the trouble cracking it as the other teams are, and they're going to be able to pull away from this team. And once Syracuse, you know, falls behind, Duke gets a little bit of separation. Where does Syracuse get the offense to crawl back in the game? In the other games that they were in, they never fell behind. The Michigan State game, I think the biggest margin that Michigan State had was like five points in that game. So they never had to hit the panic button and, you know, force the issue offensively. I think that happens here. And this is one of those ones I said, even if, you know, Krzyzewski, you know, goes mercy and starts pulling some guys if they get a big lead, I'm not worried about Syracuse draining threes late to get back in and get a – Backdoor cover. You know, you're not going to see a seat and hall three pointer at the buzzer that's going to beat you there. You know, this team just doesn't have that kind of offense. I'm going to go ahead and lay the points with Duke on Friday. Check about Marco in Vegas on Twitter. Of course, one of the co founders of wagertalk.com. I work at wagertalk.com. I'm at Scott Wins on Twitter. And I'm going to say, you know, I'm just going to say it quickly. I don't think Texas Tech has the rebounding to take advantage of Purdue. I also think their free throw shooting hurts them and what could end up a close game with, you know, four to six point type of win. And I think Purdue comes through with the victory on one of my brackets. I only had a couple, but one of my brackets, I've got Purdue getting all the way to the final four. How about that? They'd have to win this one, though, from what I understand to get there. So to have a chance to get there. But in this particular game, best bet on the podcast for me, Purdue minus the point and a half. All right, great stuff, guys. We're going to wrap it up when we come, are back next week, which will be. Uh, Wednesday or Thursday night, not sure yet, but follow us on wagertalk.com and we'll let you know. And we'll start uh, talking a little NBA again also with Aaron Brewski. That'll be next week. Put your Sweet 16 and your Elite 8 in the win column. We'll not. We'll talk to you next week on Wager Talk. And I bet you good night. Good night. Good night. I'll catch you on the flip side.